the mystery of the cursed room is solved and all is revealed. Anonymous, today on the Classic Tales Podcast. Welcome to the Classic Tales Podcast. Thank you for listening. The vintage episodes of the Classic Tales Podcast are in full swing every Monday and Wednesday. This Monday, we'll have The Telltale Heart by Edgar Allan Poe, and on Wednesday, The Mortal Immortal by Mary Shelley. It actually takes quite a bit more work to release three episodes a week instead of one, so if you'd like to keep the vintage episodes coming, please go to classictalesaudiobooks.com and become a supporter. That monthly support really goes a long way. Thank you for your support. This week concludes our story by Anonymous of The Closed Cabinet, jointly narrated with Nancy Peterson. Evie's cousins live on an ancient estate with a cursed history. Featured in this history is a room with a closed, locked cabinet, where tradition has it that if a single woman sleeps in the room, she will die. On her third night in the room, Evie has an extremely realistic dream where she lived through the terrifying moment of a wronged woman taking revenge against her abusive husband. She awakes with a cut on her hand from a dagger she retrieved from the closed cabinet, which was open in her dream. I know that the writing of this story isn't as fast-paced as some of our other titles, but I am so impressed with the level of craft in this book. Evie is initially extremely naive and innocent, and Alan is aloof to the point of boorishness. But Evie and Alan gently move from opposite sides of the worldly experience spectrum until they meet at just the right place. And once again, a huge thank you to Nancy Peterson for her stunning narration. Do yourself a favor and check out her recordings of the Anne of Green Gable series. Links are in the show notes. And now, The Closed Cabinet, Part 3 of 3, by Anonymous, narrated with Nancy Peterson. Six. When I again became conscious, I found myself half kneeling, half lying across the bed, my arms stretched out in front of me, my face buried in the clothes. Body and mind were alike numbed, a smarting pain in my left hand, a dreadful terror in my heart, were at first the only sensations of which I was aware. Slowly, very slowly, sense and memory returned to me, and with them a more vivid intensity of mental anguish, as detail by detail I recalled the weird horror of the night. Had it really happened? Was the thing still there? Or was it all a ghastly nightmare? It was some minutes before I dared either to move or look up, and then fearfully I raised my head. Before me stretched the smooth white coverlet, faintly bright with yellow sunshine. Weak and giddy, I struggled to my feet and steadying myself against the foot of the bed with clenched teeth and bursting heart, forced my gaze round to the other end. The pillow lay there, bare and unmarked, save for what might well have been the pressure of my own head. My breath came more freely and I turned to the window. The sun had just risen, the golden treetops were touched with light, faint threads of mist hung here and there across the sky, and the twittering of birds sounded clearly through the crisp autumn air. It was nothing but a bad dream then, after all, this horror which still clung round me, leaving me incapable of effort, almost of thought. I remembered the cabinet and looked swiftly in that direction. There it stood, closed as usual, closed as it had been the evening before, as it had been for the last three hundred years, except in my dreams. Yes, that was it, nothing but a dream, a gruesome haunting dream, with an instinct of wiping out the dreadful memory, I raised my hand wearily to my forehead. As I did so, 
I became conscious again of how it hurt me. I looked at it. It was covered with half-dried blood, and two straight clean cuts appeared, one across the palm and one across the inside of the fingers just below the knuckles. I looked again towards the bed, and, in the place where my hand had rested during my faint, a small patch of red blood was to be seen. Then it was true. Then it had all happened. With a low, shuddering sob, I threw myself down upon the couch at the foot of the bed and lay there for some minutes, my limbs trembling and my soul shrinking within me. A mist of evil, fearful and loathsome, had descended upon my girlhood's life, sullying its ignorant innocence, saddening its brightness, as I felt forever. I lay there till my teeth began to chatter, and I realized that I was bitterly cold. To return to that accursed bed was impossible, so I pulled a rug which hung at one end of the sofa over me, and, utterly worn out in mind and body, fell uneasily asleep. I was roused by the entrance of my maid. I stopped her exclamations and questions by shortly stating that I had had a bad night, had been unable to rest in bed, and had had an accident with my hand, without further specifying of what description. I didn't know that you'd been feeling unwell when you went to bed last night, miss, she said. When I went to bed last night? Unwell? What do you mean? Only Mr. Allen has just asked me to let him know how you find yourself this morning, she answered. Then he expected something, dreaded something. Oh, why had he yielded and allowed me to sleep here, I asked myself bitterly, as the incidents of the day before flashed through my mind. Tell him, I said, what I have told you, and say that I wish to speak to him directly after breakfast. I could not confide my story to anyone else, but speak of it I must to someone, or go mad. Every moment passed in that place was an added misery. Much to my maid's surprise, I said that I would dress in her room, the little one which, as I have said, was close to my own. I felt better there, but my utter fatigue and my wounded hand combined to make my toilet slow, and I found that most of the party had finished breakfast when I reached the dining room. I was glad of this, for even as it was, I found it difficult enough to give coherent answers to the questions which my white face and bandaged hand called forth. Alan helped me by giving a resolute turn to the conversation. Once only our eyes met across the table. He looked as haggard and worn as I did. I learned afterwards that he had passed most of that fearful night pacing the passage outside my door, though he listened in vain for any indication of what was going on within the room. The moment I had finished breakfast, he was by my side. You wish to speak to me? Now? He asked in a low tone. Yes, now, I answered breathlessly and without raising my eyes from the ground. Where shall we go? Outside? It is a bright day, and we shall be freer there from interruption. I assented, and then looking up at him appealingly. Will you fetch my things for me? I cannot go up to that room again. He seemed to understand me, nodded, and was gone. A few minutes later, we left the house and made our way in silence toward a grassy spot on the side of the ravine where we had already indulged in more than one friendly talk. As we went, the dead stone came for a moment into view. I seized Alan's arm in an almost convulsive grip. Tell me, I whispered. You refused to tell me yesterday, but you must now. Who is buried beneath that rock? There was now neither timidity nor embarrassment in my tone. The horrors of that house had become part of my life forever, and their secrets were mine by right. Alan, after a moment's pause, a questioning glance at my face, tacitly accepted the position. I told you the truth, he replied, when I said that I did not know. But I can tell you the popular tradition on the subject, if you like. They say that 
Margaret Mervyn, the woman who murdered her husband, is buried there, and the Dame Alice had the rock placed over her grave. Whether to save it from insult or to mark it out for opprobrium, I never heard. The poor people about here do not care to go near the place after dark, and among the older ones there are still some, I believe, who spit at the suicide's grave as they pass. Poor woman! Poor woman! I exclaimed in a burst of uncontrollable compassion. Why should you pity her? demanded he with sudden sternness. She was a suicide and a murderess too. It would be better for the public conscience, I believe, if such were still hung in chains or buried at the crossroads with a stake through their bodies. Hush, Alan, hush! I cried hysterically as I clung to him. Don't speak harshly of her. You do not know, you cannot tell, how terribly she was tempted. How can you? He looked down at me in bewildered surprise. How can I? He repeated. You speak as if you could. What do you mean? Don't ask me, I answered, turning towards him my face, white, quivering, tear-stained. Don't ask me. Not now. You must answer my questions first, and after that I will tell you. But I cannot talk of it now. Not yet. We had reached the place we were in search of as I spoke. There, where the spreading roots of a great beech tree formed a natural resting place upon the steep side of the ravine, I took my seat, and Alan stretched himself upon the grass beside me. Then, looking up at me, I do not know what questions you would ask, he said quietly, but I will answer them, whatever they may be. But I did not ask them yet. I sat instead with my hands clasping my knee, looking opposite at the glory of harmonious color, or down the glen at the vista of far-off, dreamlike loveliness on which it opened out. The yellow autumn sunshine made everything golden. The fresh autumn breezes filled the air with life. But to me, a loathsome shadow seemed to rest upon all, and to stretch itself out far beyond where my eyes could reach, befouling the beauty of the whole wide world. At last I spoke. You have known of it all, I suppose. Of this curse that is in the world. Sin and suffering and what such words mean. Yes, he said, looking at me with wondering pity. I am afraid so. But have you known them as they are known to some? Agonized, hopeless suffering and sin that is all but inevitable. Sometime in your life, probably, you have realized that such things are. It has come home to you, and to everyone else, no doubt, except a few ignorant girls such as I was yesterday. But there are some, yes, thousands and thousands, who even now, at this moment, are feeling sorrow like that, are sinking deep, deeper into the bottomless pit of their soul's degradation. And yet men who know this, who have seen it, laugh, talk, are happy, amuse themselves. How can they? How can they? I stopped with a catch in my voice, and then stretching out my arms in front of me. And it is not only men. Look how beautiful the earth is, and God has made it, and lets the sun crown it every day with a new glory while this horror of evil broods over and poisons it all. Oh, why is it so? I cannot understand it. My arms drooped again as I finished, and my eyes sought Alan's. His were full of tears, but there was almost a smile quivering at the corners of his lips as he replied. When you have found an answer to that question, Heavy, come and tell me. And mankind at large, it will be news to us all. Then he continued. But after all, the earth is beautiful, and the sun does shine. We have our own happiness to rejoice in, our own sorrows to bear, the suffering that is near to us to grapple with. For the rest, for this blackness of evil which surrounds us, in which we can do nothing to lighten, 
it will soon, thank God, become vague and far off to you as it is to others. Your feeling of it will be dulled, and, except at moments, you too will forget. But that is horrible, I exclaimed passionately. The evil will be there all the same, whether I feel it or not. Men and women will be struggling in their misery and sin. Only I shall be too selfish to care. We cannot go outside the limits of our own nature, he replied. Our knowledge is shallow, and our spiritual insight dark. And God in his mercy has made our hearts shallow too, and our imagination dull. If, knowing and trusting only as men do, we were to feel as angels feel, earth would be hell indeed. It was cold comfort, but at that moment anything warmer or brighter would have been unreal and utterly repellent to me. I hardly took in the meaning of his words, but it was as if a hand had been stretched out to me, struggling in the deep mire, by one who himself felt solid ground beneath him. Where he stood, I also might some day stand, and that thought seemed to make patience possible. It was he who first broke the silence which followed. You were saying that you had questions to ask me. I am impatient to put mine in return, so please go on. It had been a relief to me to turn even to generalizations of despair from the actual horror which had inspired them, and to which my mind was thus recalled. With an effort I replied, Yes, I want to ask you about that room, the room in which I slept, and, and the murder which was committed there. In spite of all that I could do, my voice sank almost to a whisper as I concluded, and I was trembling from head to foot. Who told you that a murder was committed there? Something in my face as he asked the question made him add quickly, Never mind, you are right. That is the room in which Hugh Mervyn was murdered by his wife. I was surprised at your question, for I did not know that anyone but my brothers and myself were aware of the fact. The subject is never mentioned. It is closely connected with one intensely painful to our family. Besides, if spoken of, there would be inconveniences arising from the superstitious terrors of servants, and the natural dislike of guests to sleep in a room where such a thing had happened. Indeed, it was largely with the view of wiping out the last memory of the crime's locality that my father renewed the interior of the room some twenty years ago. The only tradition which has been adhered to in connection with it is the one which has now been violated in your person, the one which precludes any unmarried woman from sleeping there. Except for that, the room has, as you know, lost all sinister reputation, and its title of haunted has become purely conversational. Nevertheless, as I said, you are right. That is undoubtedly the room in which the murder was committed. He stopped and looked up at me, waiting for more. Go on, tell me about it, and what followed. My lips formed the words. My heart beat too faintly for my breath to utter them. About the murder itself there is not much to tell. The man, I believe, was an inhuman scoundrel, and the woman first killed him in desperation, and afterwards himself in despair. The only detail connected with the actual crime of which I have ever heard was the gale that was blowing that night, the fiercest known to this countryside in that generation. And it has always been said since that any misfortune to the Mervins, especially any misfortune connected with the curse, comes with a storm of wind. That was why I so disliked your story of the imaginary tempests which have disturbed your nights since you slept there. As to what followed, he gave a sigh. That story is long enough and full of incident. On the morning after the murder, so runs the tale, Dame Alice came down to the Grange from the tower to which she had retired when her son's wickedness had driven her from his house. And there, in the presence of the two corpses, she foretold the curse which should rest upon their descendants for generations to come. 
A clergyman who was present, horrified, it is said at her words, adjured her by the mercy of heaven to place some term to the doom which she had pronounced. She replied that no mortal might reckon the fruit of a plant which drew its life from hell, that a term there should be, but as it passed the wisdom of man to fix it, so it should pass the wit of man to discover it. She then placed in the room this cabinet, constructed by herself and her Italian follower, and said that the curse should not depart from the family until the day when its doors were unlocked and its legend read. Such is the story. I tell it to you as it was told to me. One thing only is certain, that the doom last traditionally foretold has been only too amply fulfilled. And what was the tomb? Alan hesitated a little, and when he spoke, his voice was almost awful in its passionless sternness, in its despairing finality. It seemed to echo the irrevocable judgment which his words pronounced. That the crimes against God and each other, which had destroyed the parents' life, should enter into the children's blood and that never thereafter should there fail a Mervyn to bring shame or death upon one generation of his father's house. There were two sons of that ill-fated marriage, he went on after a pause, boys at the time of their parents' death. When they grew up, they both fell in love with the same woman, and one killed the other in a duel. The story of the next generation was a peculiarly sad one, Two brothers took opposite sides during the civil troubles, but so fearful were they of the curse which lay upon the family that they chiefly made use of their mutual position in order to protect and guard each other. After the wars were over, the younger brother, while travelling upon some parliamentary commission, stopped an eye to the Grange. There, through a mistake, he exchanged the report which he was bringing to London for a packet of papers implicating his brother and several besides in a royalist plot. He only discovered his error as he handed the papers to his superior, and was but just able to warn his brother in time for him to save his life by flight. The other men involved were taken and executed, and as it was known, by what means information had reached the government, the elder Mervyn was universally charged with the vilest treachery. It is said that when after the restoration his return home was rumoured, the neighbouring gentry assembled, armed with riding whips, to flog him out of the country, if he should dare to show his face there. He died abroad, shame-stricken and broken-hearted. It was his son, brought up by his uncle in the sternest tenets of Puritanism, who, coming home after a lengthened journey, found that during his absence his sister had been shamefully seduced. He turned her out of doors, then and there, in the midst of a bitter January night, and the next morning her dead body and that of her newborn infant were found half-buried in the fresh-fallen snow in the top of the walls. The white lady is still supposed by the villagers to haunt that side of the glen, and so it went on. A beautiful, heartless Mervyn in Queen Anne's time enticed away the affections of her sister's betrothed, and on the day of her own wedding with him, her forsaken sister was found drowned by her own act in the pond at the bottom of the garden. Two brothers were soldiers together in some continental war, and one was involuntarily the means of discovering and exposing the treason of the other. A girl was betrayed into a false marriage, and her life ruined by a man who came into the house as her brother's friend and whose infamous designs were forwarded and finally accomplished by that same brother's active, though unsuspecting, assistance. Generation after generation, men or women, guilty or innocent, through the action of their own will or in spite of it, the curse has never yet failed of its victims. Never yet? But surely in our own time, your father? I did not dare to put the question which was burning my lips. Have you never heard of the tragic end of my poor young uncles? He replied. They were several years older than my father, 
when boys of fourteen and fifteen, they were sent out with the keeper for their first shooting lesson, and the elder shot his brother through the heart. He himself was delicate, and they say that he never entirely recovered from the shock. He died before he was twenty, and my father, then a child of seven years old, became the heir. It was partly, no doubt, owing to this calamity having thus occurred before he was old enough to feel it, that his comparative scepticism on the whole subject was due. To that, I suppose, and to the fact that he grew up in an age of railways and liberal culture. He didn't believe, then, in the curse? Well, rather, he thought nothing about it. Until, that is, the time came when it took effect— to break his heart and end his life. How do you mean? There was silence for a little. Alan had turned away his head so that I could not see his face. Then... I suppose you have never been told the true story of why Jack left the country? No. Was he... Is he... He is one victim of the curse in this generation. And I, God help me, am the other, and perhaps more, wretched one. His voice trembled and broke, and for the first time that day I almost forgot the mysterious horror of the night before, in my pity for the actual, tangible suffering before me. I stretched out my hand to his, and his fingers closed on mine with a sudden, painful grip. Then quietly... I will tell you the story, he said, though since that miserable time I have spoken of it to no one. There was a pause before he began. He lay there by my side, his gaze turned across me up the sun-bright autumn-tinted glen, but his eyes shadowed by the memories which he was striving to recall and arrange in due order in his mind. And when he did speak, it was not directly to begin the promised recital. You never knew, Jack, he said abruptly. Hardly, I acquiesced. I remember thinking him very handsome. There could not be two opinions as to that, he answered. And a man who could have done anything he liked with life had things gone differently. His abilities were fine, but his strength lay above all in his character. He was strong strong in his likes and in his dislikes, resolute, fearless, incapable of half-measures, a man, every inch of him. He was not generally popular, stiff, hard, unsympathetic, people called him. From one point of view, and one only, he perhaps deserved the epithets. If a woman lost his respect, she seemed to lose his pity too, like a medieval monk, he looked upon such rather as the cause than the result of male depravity, and his contempt for them mingled with anger, almost, as I sometimes thought, with hatred. And this attitude was, I have no doubt, resented by the men of his own class and set, who shared neither his faults nor his virtues. But in other ways he was not hard. He could love. I at least have cause to know it. If you would hear his story rightly from my lips, Evie, you must try and see him with my eyes, the friend who loved me, and whom I loved with a passion which, if not the strongest, is certainly, I believe, the most enduring of which men are capable, that perfect brother's love, which so grows into our being that when it is at peace we are scarcely conscious of its existence and when it is wounded, our very life-blood seems to flow at the stroke. Brothers do not always love like that. I can only wish that we had not done so. 7. Well, about five years ago, before I had taken my degree, I became acquainted with a woman whom I will call Delia. It is near enough to the name by which she went. She was a few years older than myself, very beautiful, and I believed her to be what she described herself, an innocent victim of circumstance and false appearance, a helpless prey to the vile calumnies of worldlings. 
in sober fact. I'm afraid that, whatever her life may have been actually at the time that I knew her, a subject which I have never cared to investigate, her past had been not only bad enough irretrievably to fix her position in society, but bad enough to leave her without an ideal in the world, though still retaining within her heart the possibilities of a passion which, from the moment that it came to life, was strong enough to turn her whole existence into one desperate, reckless straining after an object hopelessly beyond her reach. That was the woman with whom, at the age of twenty, I fancied myself in love. She wanted to get a husband, and she thought me, rightly, ass enough to accept the post. I was very young then, even for my years, a student, an idealist, with an imagination highly developed and no knowledge whatever of the world as it actually is. Anyhow, before I had known her a month, I had determined to make her my wife. My parents were abroad at the time, George and Lucy here, so that it was Jack that I imparted the news of my resolve. As you may imagine, he did all that he could to shake it. But I was immovable. I disbelieved his facts, and despised his contempt from the standpoint of my own superior morality. This state of things continued for several weeks, during the greater part of which time I was at Oxford. I only knew that while I was there, Jack had made Delia's acquaintance, and was apparently cultivating it assiduously. One day, during the Easter vacation, I got a note from her, asking me to supper at her house. Jack was invited too. We lodged together while my people were away. There is no need to dwell upon that supper. There were two or three women there, of her own sort, or worse, and a dozen men from among the most profligate in London. The conversation was, I should think, bad even for that class. And she, the goddess of my idolatry, outstripped them all by the foul, coarse shamelessness of her language and behaviour. Before the entertainment was half over, I rose and took my leave, accompanied by Jack and another man. Leggard was his name who I presume was bored. Just as we had passed through into the ante-room, which lay beyond the one in which we had been eating, Delia followed us, and laying her hand on Jack's arm, said that she must speak with him. Leggard and I went into the outer hall, and we had not been there more than a minute, when the door from the ante-room opened and we heard Delia's voice. I remember the words well. That was not the only occasion on which I was to hear them. I will keep the ring as a record of my love, she said, and understand that though you may forget, I never shall. Jack came through, the door closed, and as we went out I glanced towards his left hand, and saw, as I expected to see, the absence of the ring which he usually wore there. It contained a gem which my mother had picked up in the east, and I knew that he valued it quite peculiarly. We always called it Jack's Talisman. A miserable time followed, a time for me of agonizing wonder and doubt, during which regret for my dead illusion was entirely swallowed up in the terrible dread of my brother's degradation. Then came the announcement of his engagement to Lady Sylvia Gray, and a week later, the very day after I had finally returned to London from Oxford, I received a summons from Delia to come and see her. Curiosity, and the haunting fear about Jack, which still hung round me, induced me to consent to what otherwise would have been intolerably repellent to me, and I went. I found her in a mad passion of fury. Jack had refused to see her or to answer her letters, and she had sent for me that I might give him her message, tell him that he belonged to her and her only, and that he never should marry another woman. Angry at my interference, Jack disdained even to repudiate her claims, only sending back a threat of appealing to the police if she ventured upon any further annoyance. I wrote as she told me, and she emphasized my silence on the subject by writing back to me a more definitive and explicit assertion of her rights. 
Beyond that, for some weeks she made no sign. I have no doubt that she had means of keeping watch upon both his movements and mine. And during that time, as she relinquished gradually all hopes of inducing him to abandon his purpose, she was being driven to her last despairing resolve. Later, when all was over, Jack told me the story of that spring and summer. He told me how, when he found me immovable on the subject, he had resolved to stop the marriage somehow through Delia herself. He had made her acquaintance and sought her society frequently. She had taken a fancy to him, and he admitted that he had availed himself of this fact to increase his intimacy with her, and as he hoped, ultimately, his power over her. But he was not conscious of ever having varied in his manner towards her of contemptuous indifference. This contradictory behaviour, his being constantly near her, yet always beyond her reach, was probably the very thing which excited her fancy into passion, the one strong passion of the poor woman's life. Then came his deliberate demand that she should, by her own act, unmask herself in my sight. The unfortunate woman tried to bargain for some proof of affection in return, and on this occasion had first openly declared her feelings towards him. He did not believe her. He refused her terms. But when, as her payment, she asked for the ring, which was so especially associated with herself, he agreed to give it to her. Otherwise hoping, no doubt against hope, dreading above all things a quarrel and final separation, she submitted unconditionally. And from the time of that evening, when Leggard and I had overheard her parting words, Jack never saw her again until the last and final catastrophe. It was in July. My parents had returned to England, but had come straight on here. Jack and I were dining together with Lady Sylvia at her father's house, her brother, young Grey, making the fourth at dinner. I had arranged to go to a party with your mother, and I told the servants that a lady would call for me early in the evening. The house stood in Park Lane, and after dinner we all went out onto the broad balcony which opened from the drawing-room. There was a strong wind blowing that night, and I remember well the vague, disquieted feeling of unreality that possessed me, sweeping through me, as it were, with each gust of wind. Then suddenly a servant stood behind me, saying that a lady had come for me and was in the drawing-room. Shocked that my aunt should have troubled herself to come so far, I turned quickly, stepped back into the room, and found myself face to face with Delia. She was fully dressed for the evening, with a long silk opera cloak over her shoulders, her face as white as her gown, her splendid eyes strangely wide open and shining. I don't know what I said or did. I tried to get her away, but it was too late. The others had heard us, and appeared at the open window. Jack came forward at once, speaking rapidly, fiercely, telling her to leave the house at once promising desperately that he would see her in his own rooms on the morrow. Well, I remember how her answer rang out. Neither tomorrow nor another day. I will never leave you again while I live. At the same instant, she drew something swiftly from under her cloak. There was the sound of a pistol shot, and she lay dead at our feet, her blood splashing upon Jack's shirt and hands as she fell. Alan paused in his recital. He was trembling from head to foot, but he kept his eyes turned steadily downwards, and both face and voice were cold, almost expressionless. Of course there was an inquest, he resumed, which, as usual, exercised its very ill-defined powers in inquiring into all possible motives for the suicide. Young Grey, who had stepped into the room just before the shot had been fired, swore to the last words Delia had uttered, leggard to those he had overheard the night of that dreadful supper. There were scores of men to bear witness to the intimate relations which had existed between her and Jack during the whole of the previous spring. I had to give evidence. A skilful lawyer had been retained by one of her sisters, and had been instructed by her on points which no doubt she had originally learnt from Delia herself. In his hands, 
I had not only to corroborate Gray and Laggard, and to give full details of that last interview, but also to swear to the peculiar value which Jack attached to the talisman ring which he had given Delia, to the language she had held when I saw her after my return from Oxford, to her subsequent letter, and Jack's fatal silence on the occasion. The story by which Jack and I strove to account for the facts was laughed at as a clumsy invention, and my undisguised reluctance in giving evidence added greatly to its weight against my brother's character. The jury returned a verdict of suicide while of unsound mind, the result of desertion by her lover. You may imagine how that verdict was commented upon by every radical newspaper in the kingdom, and for once society more than corroborated the opinions of the press. The larger public regarded the story as an extreme case of an innocent victim and the cowardly society villain. It was only among a comparatively small set that Delia's reputation was known, and there, in view of Jack's notorious and peculiar intimacy, his repudiation of all relations with her was received with contemptuous incredulity. That he should have first entered upon such relations at the very time when he was already courting Lady Sylvia was regarded even in those circles as a strong order and they looked upon his present attitude with great indignation, as a cowardly attempt to save his own character by casting upon the dead woman's memory all the odium of a false accusation. With an entire absence of logic, too, he was made responsible for the suicide having taken place in Lady Sylvia's presence. She had broken off the engagement the day after the catastrophe, and her family, a clan powerful in the London world, furious at the mud through which her name had been dragged, did all they could to intensify the feeling already existing against Jack. Not a voice was raised in his defence. He was advised to leave the army, he was requested to withdraw from some of his clubs, turned out of others, avoided by his fast acquaintances, cut by his respectable ones. It was enough to kill a weaker man. He showed no resentment at the measure thus dealt out to him. Indeed, at the first, except for Sylvia's desertion of him, he seemed dully indifferent to it all. It was as if his soul had been stunned. From the moment that that wretched woman's blood had splashed upon his fingers and her dead eyes had looked up into his own. But it was not long before he realized the full extent of the social damnation which had been inflicted upon him, and he then resolved to leave the country and go to America. The night before he started, he came down here to take leave. I was here, looking after my parents. George, whose mind was almost unhinged by the family disgrace, having gone abroad with his wife. My mother, at the first news of what had happened, had taken to her bed, never to leave it again. And thus it was in my presence alone, up there in my father's little study, that Jack gave him that night the whole story. He told it quietly enough, but when he had finished, with a sudden outburst of feeling, he turned upon me. It was I who had been the cause of it all. My insensate folly had induced him to make the unhappy woman's acquaintance, to allow and even encourage her fatal love, to commit all the blunders and sins which had brought about her miserable ending and his final overthrow. It was by means of me that she had obtained access to him on that dreadful night, my evidence which most utterly damned him in public opinion. Through me he had lost his reputation, his friends, his career, his country, the woman he loved, his hopes for the future, through me, above all, that the burden of that horrible death would lie forever on his soul. He was lashing himself to fury with his own words as he spoke, and I stood, leaning against the wall opposite to him, cold, dumb, unresisting, when suddenly my father interrupted. I think that both Jack and I had forgotten his presence, but at the sound of his voice, changed from what we had ever heard it, we turned to him, and I then for the first time saw in his face the death look which never afterwards quitted it. Stop! 
Jack, he said. Alan is not to blame, and if it had not been in this way, it would have been in some other. I only am guilty, who brought you both into existence with my own hell-stained blood in your veins. If you wish to curse any one, curse your family, your name, me if you will, and may God forgive me that you were ever born into the world. Alan stopped with a shudder, and then continued, dully. It was when I heard those words, the most terrible that a father could have uttered, that I first understood all that that old sixteenth-century tale might mean to me and mine. I have realized it vividly enough since. Early the next morning, when the dawn was just breaking, Jack came to the door of my room to bid me goodbye. All his passion was gone. His looks and tones seemed part and parcel of the dim grey morning light. He withdrew freely all the charges he had made against me the night before, forgave me all the share that I had had in his misfortunes, and then begged me that I would never come near him or let him hear from me again. The curse is heavy upon us both, he said, and it is the only favour which you can do me. I have never seen him since. But you have heard of him, I exclaimed. What has become of him? Alan raised himself to a sitting posture. The last that I heard, he said with a catch in his voice, was that in his misery and hopelessness he was taking to drink. George writes to him and does what he can, but I, I dare not say a word for I fear it should turn to poison on my lips. I dare not lift a hand to help him, for fear it should have power to strike him to the ground. The worst may be yet to come. I am still living, still living. There are depths of shame to which he has not sunk. And oh, Evie, Evie, he is my own, my best loved brother. All his composure was gone now. His voice rose to a kind of wail with the last words, and folding his arms on his raised knee, he let his head fall upon them, while his figure quivered with scarcely restrained emotion. There was a silence for some moments while he sat thus, I looking on in wretched helplessness beside him. Then he raised his head, and without looking round at me, went on in a low tone, and what is in the future? I pray that death, instead of shame, may be the portion of the next generation. And I look at George's boys only to wonder which of them is the happy one who shall some day lie dead at his brother's feet. Are you surprised at my resolution never to marry? The fatal prophecy is rich in its fulfillment. None of our name and blood are safe the day might come when I, too, should have to call upon my children to curse me for their birth, should have to watch while the burden which I could no longer bear alone pressed the life from their mother's heart. Through the tragedy of this speech, I was conscious of a faint suggestion of comfort, a far-off glimmer, as of unseen home lights on a midnight sky. I was in no mood then to understand or to seek to understand what it was. But I know now that his words had removed the weight of helpless banishment from my spirit. That his heart, speaking through them to my own, had made me for life the sharer of his grief. 8. Presently, he drew his shoulders together with a slight determined jerk, threw himself back upon the grass, and turning to me with that tremulous, haggard smile upon his lips which I knew so well, but which had never before struck me with such infinite pathos. Luckily, he said, there are other things to do in life besides being happy. Only perhaps you understand now what I meant last night when I spoke of things which flesh and blood cannot bear and yet which must be born. 
Suddenly and sharply, his words roused again into activity the loathsome memory which my interest in his story had partially deadened. He noticed the quick involuntary contraction of my muscles and read it aright. That reminds me, he went on. I must claim your promise. I have told you my story. Now tell me yours. I told him, not as I have set it down here, though perhaps even in greater detail but incoherently, bit by bit, while he helped me out with gentle questions, quickly comprehending gestures and patient waiting during the pauses of exhaustion which perforce interposed themselves. As my story approached its climax, his agitation grew almost equal to my own, and he listened to the close, his teeth clenched, his brows bent, as if passing again with me through that awful conflict. When I had finished, it was some moments before either of us could speak. And then he burst forth into bitter self-reproach for having so far yielded to his brother's angry obstinacy as to allow me to sleep the third night in that fatal room. It was cowardice, he said. Sheer cowardice. After all that has happened, I dared not have a quarrel with one of my own blood. Yet if I had not hardened my heart, I had reason to know what I was risking. How do you mean? I asked. Those other two girls who slept there, he said breathlessly. It was in each case after the third night there that they were found dead. Dead, Evie. So runs the story, with a mark upon their necks similar in shape and position to the death wound which Margaret Mervyn inflicted upon herself. I could not speak, but I clutched his hand with an almost convulsive grip. And I knew the story. I knew it, he cried. As boys, we were not allowed to hear much of our family traditions, but this one I knew. When my father redid the interior of the East Room, he removed at the same time a board from above the doorway outside, on which had been written, it is said by Dame Alice herself, a warning upon this very subject. I happened to be present when our old housekeeper, who had been his nurse, remonstrated with him warmly upon this act, and I asked her afterwards what the board was, and why she cared about it so much. In her excitement she told me the story of those unhappy girls, repeating again and again that if the warning were taken away, evil would come of it. And she was right, I said dully. Oh, if only your father had left it there. I suppose, he answered, speaking more quietly, that he was impatient of traditions which, as I told you, he at that time more than half despised. Indeed, he altered the shape of the doorway, raising it and making it flat and square, so that the old inscription could not have been replaced, even had it been wished. I remember it was fitted round the low Tudor arch, which was previously there. My mind, too worn with many emotions for deliberate thought, wandered on languidly, as it were mechanically, upon these last trivial words. The doorway presented itself to my view, as it had originally stood, with the discarded warning above it, and then, by a spontaneous comparison of mental vision, I recalled the painted board which I had noticed three days before in Dame Alice's tower. I suggested to Alan that it might have been the identical one. Its shape was as he described. Very likely, he answered absently. Do you remember what the words were? Yes, I think so, I replied. Let me see. And I repeated them slowly, dragging them out, as it were, one by one from my memory. Where the woman sinned, the maid shall win. But God help the maid that sleeps within. You see, I said, turning towards him slowly, the last line is a warning such as you spoke of. But to my surprise, Alan had sprung to his feet and was looking down at me, his whole body quivering with excitement. Yes, Evie he cried. And the first line is a prophecy. Where the woman sinned, the maid has won. 
He seized the hand which I instinctively reached out to him. We have not seen the end of this yet, he went on, speaking rapidly, and as if articulation had become difficult to him. Come, Evie, we must go back to the house and look at the cabinet, now, at once. I had risen to my feet by this time, but I shrank away at those words. To that room? Oh, Alan, no, I cannot. He had hold of my hand still, and he tightened his grasp upon it. I shall be with you. You will not be afraid with me, he said. Come. His eyes were burning, his face flushed and paled in rapid alternation, and his hand held mine like a vice of iron. I turned with him and we walked back to the Grange, Alan quickening his pace as he went, till I almost had to run by his side. As we approached the dreaded room, my sense of repulsion became almost unbearable. But I was now infected by his excitement, though I but dimly comprehended its cause. We met no one on our way, and in a moment he had hurried me into the house, up the stairs, and along that narrow passage, and I was once more in the East Room, and in the presence of all the memories of that accursed night. For an instant I stood strengthless, helpless, on the threshold, my gaze fixed, panic-stricken on the spot where I had taken such awful part in that phantom tragedy of evil. Then Alan threw his arm around me and drew me hastily on in front of the cabinet. Without a pause, giving himself time neither to speak nor think, he stretched out his left hand and moved the buttons one after another. How or in what direction he moved them I know not, but as the last turned with a click, the doors, which no mortal hand had unclosed for three hundred years, flew back, and the cabinet stood open. I gave a little gasp of fear. Alan pressed his lips closely together and turned to me with eager questioning in his eyes. I pointed in answer tremblingly at the drawer which I had seen open the night before. He drew it out, and there on its satin bed, lay the dagger in its silver sheath. Still without a word, he took it up, and reaching his right hand round me, for I could not now have stood had he withdrawn his support. With a swift, strong jerk, he unsheathed the blade. There in the clear autumn sunshine, I could see the same dull stains I had marked in the flickering candlelight, and over them, still ruddy and moist, were the drops of my own half-dried blood. I grasped the lapel of his coat with both my hands and clung to him like a child in terror, while the eyes of both of us remained fixed, as if fascinated upon the knife blade. Then, with a sudden start of memory, Alan raised his to the corners of the cabinet, and mine followed. No change that I could detect had taken place in that twisted gold work. But there, clear in the sight of us both, stood forth the words of the magic motto. Pure blood, shed by the blood-stained knife, ends Mervyn's shame, heals Mervyn's strife. In low, steady tones, Alan read out the lines, and then there was silence. On my part of stunned bewilderment, the bewilderment of a spirit overwhelmed beyond the power of comprehension by rushing, conflicting emotions. Alan pressed me closer to him while the silence seemed to throb with the beating of his heart and the panting of his breath. But except for that, he remained motionless, gazing at the golden message before him. At length, I felt a movement, and looking up, saw his face turned down towards mine, the lips quivering, the cheeks flushed, the eyes soft with passionate feeling. We are saved, my darling, he whispered. Saved, and through you. Then he bent his head lower, and there, in that room of horror, I received the first long lover's kiss from my own dear husband's lips. My husband, yes but not till some time after that. 
Alan's first act, when he had once fully realized that the curse was indeed removed, was, throwing his budding practice to the winds, to set sail for America. There he sought out Jack, and labored hard to impart to him some of his own newfound hope. It was slow work, but he succeeded at last, and only left him when, two years later, he had handed him over to the charge of a bright-eyed Western girl to whom the whole story had been told, and who showed herself ready and anxious to help in building up again the broken life of her English lover. To judge from the letters that we have since received, she has shown herself well fitted for the task. Among other things, she has money, and Jack's worldly affairs have so prospered that George declares that he can well afford now to waste some of his superfluous cash upon farming a few of his elder brother's acres. The idea seems to smile upon Jack, and I have every hope this winter of being able to institute an actual comparison between our small boy, his namesake, and his own three-year-old Alan. The comparison, by the way, will have to be conditional, for Jacket, the name by which my son and heir is familiarly known, is but a little more than two. I turn my eyes for a moment, and they fall upon the northern corner of the East Room, which shows round the edge of the house. Then the skeleton leaps from the cupboard of my memory. The icy hand, which lies ever near my soul, grips it suddenly with a chill shudder. Not for nothing was that wretched woman's life interwoven with my own, if only for an hour. Not for nothing did my spirit harbor a conflict and an agony, which, thank God, are far from its own story. Though Margaret Mervyn's dagger failed to pierce my flesh, the wound in my soul may never wholly be healed. I know that that is so. And yet, as I turn to stop through the sunshine to the cedar shade and its laughing occupants, I whisper to myself with fervent conviction, it was worth it. This is B.J. Harrison. I hope you've enjoyed this unabridged production of The Closed Cabinet, Part 3 of 3, by Anonymous. We've got more spooky stories by Sheridan LeFanu, Wilkie Collins, H.P. Lovecraft, and others at ClassicTalesAudiobooks.com. Click on over and check it out. Thanks for pitching in. And keep an eye open for the vintage episodes coming on Monday and Wednesday. Thank you for joining me today and allowing classic literature to awaken your better self. Please join me next time and we'll rediscover the greatest stories ever put to paper. <laughs>